The offensive of Idlib. I'm going to address this video with as less maps as possible, because the situation is changing in northwest of Hama and southern Idlib every single moment, and the map of control could change before I even upload this video on YouTube. During the course of the war in Syria, wherever the Syrian army launched a military offensive to liberate an area, the SAA or the Syrian Arab army leadership gave the militants the choice to surrender and join a reconciliation program with which means the ex-militants could return to their civil life without legal repercussions. Or they leave to Idlib by the green buses. After eight years of war, Idlib has become a safe haven for criminals, thieves, and terrorists or as Brett Mugger, the US government's special presidential envoy for the global coalition to counter ISIS, called Idlib. Um. Idlib province is the largest al-Qaeda safe haven since 9-11, tied directly to Ayman al-Sahiri. This is a huge problem. It's been a problem there. Some time. But we have to ask a question, why and how is Ayman al-Sahiri's deputy finding his way to Idlib province? Why is this happening? How are they getting there? They're not paratroopers. So, and the approach, but the approach by some of our partners to send in tens of thousands of, uh, tens of, thousands of tons of, of weapons and looking the other way as these foreign fighters come into Syria may not have been the best approach. So let's agree on one thing. Idlib is not a heaven for democratic rebels or opposition fighters as some mainstream media journalists claim. In September 2018, Russia and Turkey agreed to create a demilitarized zone in Idlib to give a chance to Erdogan to solve this dangerous situation with non-military means. Back then, the deal included 1. A demilitarized buffer zone should be created to separate the two sides, stretch from 15 to 25 km that will come into effect by 15 of October 2018. Two, Troops from Russia and Turkey will patrol the zone and jihadists must abandon the areas and retreat further in the Idlib province. 3. All tanks, multiple rocket launch systems, artillery and mortars belonging to conflicting parties should be withdrawn from the demilitarized zone by October 10. 4. It was also included that M4 and M5 highways are to be open by end of 2018, linking respectively Latakia and Damascus to Aleppo. Now, of four important elements of this agreement, how, success, how successful was Turkey in implementing the agreement? In my estimation, Turkey didn't fail to implement the agreement because it had no intention whatsoever from the first place to impose a deal that is in favor of the Syrian government, Ankara wants to strike certain deals with Damascus before cleaning Idlib from the terrorists. And President Assad won't give Erdogan what he wants, which is a so-called safe zone in the north that means a de facto occupation of Turkey of the areas occupied by the US-backed Kurdish forces. Additionally, while the Syrian government accepted a demilitarized buffer zone deal in Idlib, the strongest terror groups in Idlib rejected the deal, such as the Turkestan Islamic Party, the Uyghurs of China, the Guardians of the Religion Organization, Ansar al-Tawhid, Ansar al-Din Front, Ansar al-Islam, and Hayat Tahrir al-Sham of Al-Qaeda. These terrorist groups attacked the Syrian army and fired rockets and missiles on daily basis on the residential areas in the Syrian Christian towns of Skelbiye and Maharde, on the coastal cities of Latakia and Tartus, and on Aleppo from its western suburbs. Now, the Syrian army launched a ground offensive on northwestern Hama and southern Idlib. So let's discuss together two important aspects of this battle. The first one. What is the nature of the factions fighting against the Syrian army in Idlib and Hama? The vast majority of these groups are Islamist Salafist groups. Their ultimate goal is to create an Islamic state based on the Wahhabi and Muslim Brotherhood ideology. The strongest force in Idlib is Hayat Tahrir al-Sham 
or Al-Nusra Front or Al-Qaeda, and their goal is an Islamic State. The number of the fighters estimated of Al-Nusra between 12 to 30,000 fighters. Then comes Harsham, which is also a Salafi group that calls for an Islamic State. The number of the fighters estimated between 18 to 20,000 fighters. Then also Jaysh al Azza, which has been supplied with anti-tank missiles by the United States, which is also a Salafi group and an ally to Al-Qaeda. The number of the fighters is estimated between two to 3,000. Also, we have the Turkestan Islamic Party or the Uyghurs of China, and the number is estimated between five to 10,000 fighters. We also have the Tajiki, Saudi, Egyptian, Tunisian, and terrorists from all over the world, all gathered in Idlib, and their numbers are estimated by hundreds of terrorists. In fact, no one can make concrete estimation, but let's agree on one thing. There are tens of thousands of Salafi jihadists in Idlib that should be eliminated. But how? One thing worth to mention here, the Green Bus's offer is not on the table for Idlib terrorists. So what options left? The, the first option is unconditional surrender and elimination of the multinational terrorists, which is, in my opinion, an impossible scenario. The second option, a limited fighting and big military pressure by the Syrian army that would force the local militants to surrender, join the reconciliation program, and distance themselves from Al-Qaeda and multinational jihadists. This example was adopted in Eastern Ghouta and Dara and elsewhere, and could be implemented in certain areas in Idlib. The third option, fighting till the end, which is a path that Al-Qaeda and multinational jihadists seems to be taking. If local fighters have a chance to save themselves, they will take it, but the radical elements in Idlib won't have that chance. In my estimation, the Syrian army will divide the battle into different stages. In the first stage, the Syrian Arab army will attack the terrorists in the demilitarized zone and capture it, then advance to Jusuf Shur all the way to Sarakib. Similarly, from Morek to Marit Norman until Sarakib in a bid to reopen the M4 and M5 highways and reconnect Aleppo to Damascus and to the coastal cities. Now, after liberating the upper mentioned regions, the SAA can limit the presence of the terrorists in northwest of Idlib near the borders with Turkey, a step that could pose a security threat to Turkey and force Ankara to negotiate with Damascus for its withdrawal and occupation of Syria Syrian territories in exchange to cleaning the area, that area, from the terrorists. Geopolitics aside, if any sanity left among the local fighters, I hope they distance themselves from the terrorists and take the reconciliation option and return to their civil life to spare bloodshed among all sides. But unfortunately, previous examples have proven to us that they don't learn a lesson. I'm Kirur Galmasian and you are watching Syriana Analysis.